Hey, good morning. Boy, we're looking, look at this. My four grandsons. <laughs> well, welcome to Tuesday morning. That will add a little spice to it. Now, we got to put grandma right in the middle of you two, all right? Our four, all right? So, this is all good. God is, look at that. I tell you, it's a big deal. Some of you know this, to see our children's children. It's a big deal, isn't it? Yep, yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Hannah, you don't know anything about that yet, all right? <laughs> okay, before we open in prayer... Uh, We actually, today we're going to come to one of the most well-known stories, certainly in the Bible. Very, very well-known. So you're thinking, well, I know it, I can get up and leave. Don't leave yet, Margaret, all right? See, you've taught this. You've taught this so many times, it's more than both hands, all right? The story is about a teenage boy and a giant. And we'll learn certainly a little bit about the giant. Doesn't take after Linda, takes after Deborah. But moving on, the story is about a teenage boy, big time. David, the beloved. He is chosen to be king because he because the current king does not have what David has. The first king does not have a heart after God. Doesn't. Doesn't have a heart after God. David has a heart for God. And that heart is preparing him for what he's going to be about. Uh, And by the way, in our lives, there's nothing more important to have a heart after God. And I will deal with you later, Uriah. (laughs) Let's pray. Let's pray. Father God, thank you indeed for this morning and this day. We ask that you would be the real teacher as we open up your scripture, Lord, and that which you have for us this day. In Jesus' name, amen. We are in 1 Samuel chapter 17. The Old Testament, which we have certainly been chasing for a while, but recognize that the Old Testament has the New Testament in it, but it's concealed. But as we begin to open the New Testament, it has the Old Testament in it, but it is revealed. It's just they all go together. This is part of the uh, finding the concealed in the Old Testament. Verses 1 through 10. Now the Philistines gathered their army together to battle. And they were gathered at Sokah, which belongs to Judah. And they encamped between Sokah, Ezekah, uh, of Damin, and Don't know where any of this stuff is, but I'll tell you here in a minute because I got a better idea. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and they were encamped in the valley of Elah. And that valley is about south and west of Jerusalem, about 15 miles. So south and west of Jerusalem to to get a little perspective. And they drew up in battle array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on one mountainside and Israel stood on the other mountainside with a valley in between. That is the valley of Elah. Um, And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Now, we don't use that very often, but that's between eight and a half feet and a little over nine feet tall. We would assume that he is a keeper. All right. (laughs) You have a question? You know someone that's about that size. Yeah, right. In any event, okay, we have... (laughs) Where do I go from here? All right. You see, he has learned to interrupt the way I interrupt. All right. I'm I'm trying to do better, Jim. Jim's up there just smiling. All right. (laughs) In any event... Recognize that someone of that stature was not totally um, 
unknown. The Bible speaks of giants. Also, ancient literature, Herodotus and others write of indeed people that in some cases were seven cubits high. That's almost twice, certainly it's twice my height, but it's, they're tall, okay? Okay, let's talk about how this guy was arrayed. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. The weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. That's about 200 pounds. So his shielding was about 200 pounds. He had bronze armor on his legs, bronze javelin between, uh, javelin between his shoulders. Now a staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels or 25 pounds. Just the head, just the head. And he had a shield bearer that went before him. So he had someone help him pack all that plunder. So he comes out from the Philistine army, and he says, And he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Question. Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Saul, remember, was the king of Israel. Choose a man for yourself and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you will be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. So what do we have here? What do we have here? So from the time of Joshua, we read of a people called the Anakim, all right? 400 years earlier, and they were big. And it appears some of them still remain in Gath, which is a coastal city in what we know as Israel today. The giant comes out and he gives a challenge. He says, choose a man for yourself. Let him come down to me. And he says, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. The Hebrew word in their champion, which is included in here, speaks of a middleman, a man between the two. So here was Goliath, their champion, the man between the two. Verse 11, And when Saul and all Israel heard these words, the words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. So the challenge by Goliath is very real. And what it's doing is it, it's, it's absolutely driving fear uh, into uh, Israel. Um, recognize we have an enemy of our souls that would do that day by day. He loves to drive fear into our souls. And he'd do it pretty easy with the 24 news cycle that we somewhat addicted to. All right? So before the battle even begins, before the battle even begins, there's fear in the hearts. Over and over, though, in the Scripture, the Lord says over and over, fear not, fear not, fear not. Over and over, fear not. Now Saul, the king, who was picked out because he was way tall, way, he was the perfect-looking king, obviously uh, just perfect, all right? He hears this, and he has a lot to be afraid of. If, any, if they're going to pick anybody, they're going to pick Saul to go down there and battle against him. He will have none of that, all right? He would be that choice. So this goes on one day, two days. It goes on 40 days. For 40 days, Goliath comes out of the army of the Philistines, comes down there, yells at these people, all right? See, so you have these two armies that are lined up, and all of a sudden, Goliath comes out. And Israel begins to shrink back because no one wants to deal with this. No one. This, they had, after 40 days, remember? Think about it. 10 days is something. 20, a lot. But 40, I mean, they, they are so done and they are ready to leave. At this point, God allows, quote unquote, our hero to enter the narrative. Verses 12 through 15. Now David, the son of of that Ephrath of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, who had eight sons. And the man was old, advanced in years, in the days of Saul. 
The three oldest sons of Jesse had gone to follow Saul in battle. The names of these three sons who went to battle were Elab, the firstborn, the next Abinadab, the third Shammah. David was the youngest, and the three oldest followed Saul. But David occasionally went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. By the way, returning to Saul, what, what happened there? Actually, uh, there's a whole chapter or two given to, the, to Saul who had gone into a great breakdown. And David was kind of picked out because he was very good with music. And God allowed that music to quiet Saul. So David had, I guess you'd say, the beginning of a connection within that royal household. Saul didn't realize it yet. Now back to the almost battle, verses 16 through 21. And the Philistine, and this is Goliath again, drew near and presented himself 40 days, morning and evening. Then Jesse said to the son of David, Take now for your brothers an ephah of this dried grain and these ten loaves, and run to your brothers at the camp. By the way, uh, recognize that they didn't have a big commissary, all right? They didn't have the ability to actually, uh, I mean, people had to depend on themselves oftentimes to feed. And dad was trying to take care of his three older boys there, so he's sending David in that direction. He's got 10 loaves. It goes on and carry these 10 cheeses to the captain of the thousand and see how your brothers fare and bring back news of them. Okay, picks it up now. Now Saul and all they um, and, and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. So David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with a keeper and took the things and went as Jesse commanded him, and he came to the camp as the army was going out to fight, shouting for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had drawn up in battle array, army against army. So army against army, they're yelling at each other, at each other um, shouting. Um, but when Goliath drops out of the Philistine, Israel begins to move back in fear. Verses 22 through 24. And David left his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper and ran to the army and came and greeted his brothers. Then he talked with them, and there was the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines. And he spoke according to the same words. So David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him, and they were dreadfully afraid. So, again, hear the words of the impact there. They were dreadfully afraid. Not one is ready to take on Goliath. Not one. Not one. Verses 25 through 27. So the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel, and it shall be that the man that kills him, the king will enrich with great riches and will give his daughter and will give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. Then David spoke to the men and stood by them saying, what shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? So he's getting clarification, all right? He says, for who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Who is this? And the people answered him in this manner, saying, so it shall be done for the man who kills him. So King Saul needs a solution. Forty days, this has gone on, big time. Um, the man who kills him, the king, king will enrich. So there is a three-part bribe that gets ready to go down, offered by Saul. A cash award, a princess and tax exemption. Sounds pretty good. Hmm? No takers. No takers. Okay, that's what was emphasized by the people that David is around. But all of a sudden, David says something else. 
uh, where he looks at this differently. He says, who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel. Listen to that. Takes away the reproach of Israel. He's looking at it at some other way. He says, who is this uncircumcised, uh, uncircumcised Philistine? We're talking about a pagan, all right? Okay. That he should defy the armies of the living God. It's kind of like David is looking at the reputation of Israel more than the uh, and, uh, and the honor of a living God. Hear that? That's where his heart is. Glusek, in a sense, not a sense, makes a note that he, he saw this whole thing from the Lord's perspective. But the men of Israel that are looking that, hey man, a princess, tax exemption, you know, all, you know, all the rewards, they were looking at it from man's perspective. David was looking at it from God's perspective. Verses 28 through 30. Now Elam, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. Elam's anger was aroused against David and said, Why did you come here? Question. And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? Question. I know that your pride and your insolence of heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, what have I done now? And this is important. Listen carefully where he says, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? And he turned from him toward another and said the same thing. And these people answered him as the first ones did. So what do we have here? We have the older big brother, 30 or so, early 30s max. Dave, David, Dave. David is... Uh, He's an older teenager. He's, he's probably not in his 20s at all. He's in his teens still. The youngest does not have the right to speak. That's not always true, is it? Okay, anyway. But he is treated in the eyes of his brothers as insignificant. Do you remember when we were talking about when Samuel came to Bethlehem to anoint David as king? Samuel throws a pretty good party, so to speak. It's a sacrifice of a fellowship offering. Some would be given to the Lord, but the rest would be shared. They have a big time barbecue. Seven sons of Jesse are invited. He has eight. The eighth is still keeping the sheep. And when Samuel finally finds out that uh, there's one left, well, finally they get David. He was treated as the insignificant one. He was the youngest. He was the youngest. Um, so the older brother, the oldest, why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? Um, so, Big Brother is uh, inventing reasons why David showed up, but there is a problem with the Big Brother, with what David has said. This is really important, because what David has said is right. You hear that? What David has said in front of all those men is right, and it's resonating, and it's humiliating to Big Brother. Big Brother. The rest of the army, they're dismayed. They're greatly afraid. And the last thing they need is a young kid who is courageous. They don't need that. But what he says is right. Again, he says, what have I done? Looking at Big Brother, is there not a cause? And, and the older brother should have said, yeah, there's a cause. But he, he's trying to deflect from that. Is there not a cause? The cause, God's cause, concern for the cause of God. Consider this thought, a quote from David Guzak. David was misunderstood, publicly rebu rebuked by his own brother, probably amid the laughs of the other soldiers. He could have quit, but he showed the strength of the armor of God in his life and replied rightly. He didn't care about his glory or success, but only for the glory and the success of the Lord's cause. Goliath was a dead man right then. 
this is where the battle was won. Is there not a cause? A cause of God. Spurgeon. Spurgeon has a thought here. Immediately before the encounter with the Philistine, he fought a battle which cost him far more thought, prudence, and patience. The word battle in which he, um, he had engaged with his brothers and with King Saul was a more trying ordeal to him than going forth in the strength of the Lord to smite the uncircumcised boaster. Many a man meets with more troubles from his friends than from his enemies. When he has learned to overcome the depressing influence of prudent friends, he makes short work of the opposition of avowed adversaries. Be wise, be wise. Okay, the word gets back to the king now. Take verses 31 through 32. Now when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported, they reported them to Saul. He sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him, because of Goliath. Your servant will go and fight with the Philistine. Imagine this teenage boy that shows up in front of the king. So, good news. We got someone who will fight Goliath. Bad news, he's just a kid. That's bottom line. That's the bad news. This is the first time that we see David volunteering to be in this battle. By the way, it's, it's one thing to say, you know, someone need, really needs to do something about this. You think about issues in life. Think about it. Someone really needs to do something about this. But it's a whole different story when the someone says, I will do something about it. All right? That's the difference. That's the difference. Verses 33 through 37, And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth. And he is a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went after it, I struck it, and I delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck it and killed it. Ooh, this is a tough, tough kid. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of the Philistines. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. I'll bet. And uh, this isn't a quote on the screen, but Guzak takes the comment, this outward tail of the tape said there was no way that David could win. There is no way David could win. But God's tail, God's direction, there was no way that David could lose. It continues. All right? Because God had been preparing David all his life for this battle. You know, recognize in our individual walks, all right? God is preparing us for the battles that will surely come. He is preparing us for the battles that will surely come. Okay. Now, just like the lion and the bear, the Lord who delivered me, verses 38 through 40, so Saul clothed David with his armor, and he put a bronze helmet on his head, and he clothed him with a coat of mail, and David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag in a pouch which he had. And his sling was in his hand. And he... Uh, and he drew near to the Philistine. Okay. So, if you were here Sunday, and some of you weren't, all right, I, I had a rock in my pocket. 
But not just any rock, Howard. All right? Not any at all. This rock came from the Valley of Elah. A friend of mine, when he was visiting Israel a number of years ago, picked up one down there. And I'm absolutely convinced that no doubt that's one of the five. That may have been the one that fell out of uh, Goliath's head. You know, that kind of thing. Don't believe that. Don't believe that. In any event, um, it's just, I looked at that and I just smiled. Think about this. Uh, think about the Valley of Elah and uh, the plot thickens. By the way, he picked up five rocks. Five rocks. Um, it is said one to kill Goliath. There were four left over, Asher, because Goliath had four relatives in Gath, and they were all bigger than bread boxes, okay? They were way big, okay? So he was going to take care of all of them if need be. Now, an ancient rabbinic tradition, legendary, I have to say that, the story says these five stones called out to David from the brook saying, by us you will overcome the giant. I don't know what you do with that. It was kind of fun. Okay. So he draws near to the Philistine. There was no holding back. He is our hero of faith. He is into battle. And uh, we don't want to hold back either. You don't want to hold back me either. Verses 41 through 44. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David. And the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and good looking. So the Philistine said to, the, to David, Am I a dog that you have come to me with sticks? And the Philistines cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds, uh, uh, birds of the air and the beasts of the field. I have in my notes, those are famous last words. Right there. Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Verses 45 through 47. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, hand, and I will strike and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, and all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all the assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Again, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Look at the contrast of weapons here. Goliath is well-armed, well-protected, big time. In the eyes of man, he is, you, you just can't beat him. David comes, though, with a weapon greater than any other. He says, I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. In effect, he's saying, I am sent by the God of all creation and more. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand. That is absolutely Holy Spirit boldness. More, I will strike you and take your head from you. Um, again, the Lord will deliver you into my hand. Bold, yes. But again, uh, God is the one who's doing this. And the reason for all of it, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. So there is a witness there of the reality of God. This is not just the fame of David. This is not... A princess and, and to make sure Jesse doesn't get taxed anymore or what have you, you know. This is indeed that all the earth will know. And even today, what? Now, uh, some 3,000 years later, we continue to know a witness of this. All right? 
So the fruit of this, the fruit of this, you know, the issue of, of taking the glory. David could have taken the glory here, all right? He could have gone for it. I was reminded when I was doing this study of something that Billy Graham said years and years ago. You know, here's a man that spoke to hundreds of millions of people on the planet. He was in the edge. He almost lived to 100 years of age. And, uh, you know, he's just an amazing, amazing witness uh, of, uh, of our Lord and Savior. But he would tell the leaders in their ministry, don't touch the women, don't touch the money, don't touch the glory. Because you get in that, the adulation of 100,000 people or what have you, all of it can come at you. All of it can come at you. Don't touch the women. Don't touch the money. Don't touch the glory. This was true for David. David is going to get in trouble because of this. All right? That's a, that's a ways down, okay, as we look at the, the life of David. But it's true for us today. Verses 48 through 49, just a couple of verses. So it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistines. He's not holding back. Then David put his hand into his bag and took out a stone. Let me stop here for a minute. I have not seen this uh, statue, but I was just told it could have been yesterday by another individual. Um, now I've not been to, what, I think it's in St. Peter's Basilica. And this is uh, a, uh, an incredible statue of David. And, you know, he's got the sling here and he's holding a hand here. And if you go behind the statue, you'll see there are two stones in his hand. I don't know what you do with that, but I thought, isn't that interesting? The detail or what have you. So David pulls out a stone and he slung it and he struck the Philistine in his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. Goliath is mad, runs, draws near. David uh, runs at him, meets his adversary. He trusts God. He relies on God. He runs right at the enemy. Does not hold back. Does not hold back. Spurgeon moment. The lazy bones of our Orthodox churches cry, God will do his own work. And then they look out for the softest pillow they can find and put it under their heads and say, the eternal purposes will be carried out. God will be glorified. That is all very fine talk, but it can be used with the most mischievous design. You can make opium out of it, which will lull you into a deep and dreadful slumber and prevent you being used, useful of any kind, any kind, all right, at all. Adam Clark, the battle was won out with the sheep. His comment, I think so appropriate. In those lonely hours, alone with the lambs, David talked to God and took a lot of target practice with his sling. Now his communion with the Lord and his skill with the sling are both used by God. In the use of the sling, it requires much practice to hit the mark. But when once this dexterity is acquired, the sling is nearly as fatal as a musket or a bow. All right, right there. So just to tie this up, David came to battle in the name of the Lord. Do you remember Goliath? Goliath is claiming the Philistine gods. Now, this is a while back, but there was a little event with the Philistine gods and the ark. And their god was a idol, big idol of a fish called Dagon, all right? And uh, with the ark that was captured, all right, they, uh, uh, they, w they woke up a number of mornings and they found Dagon right on his face, the idol, all right? And now we have Dagon, the fish god, right? We have now the worshiper of Dagon, the fish god, falling on his face. 
he has done. Verses 50 through 54. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David uh, ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword, this is Goliath's sword, drew it out of his sheath and killed him, cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. Now the men of Israel and Judah rose and shouted and pursued the Philistines as far as the entrance of the valley of the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell along the road at Sharon, even as far as Gath and Ekron. Then the children of Israel returned from chasing the Philistines and they plundered their tents. David took the head of the Philistine, this is Goliath, and brought it into Jerusalem, but he, uh, and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. So, Goliath has assumed room temperature, big time, all right? Philistines are fleeing for their lives, um, but David has a trophy. Now, those that hunt understand this. You shoot a big buck, you get the horns, you might even get the head mounted, all right? Okay, I don't know. Yeah, so you keep the head I've got a quote here, just a one-liner from a guy, Ellison, all right? Presumably, David had the head pickled and hung it in his banqueting hall after he captured Jerusalem. I don't know what you do with that, you know? Uh, Look at what I got in the corner here. I don't know. All right. Verses 53. You need to remember that one. Pickled Goliath head. Okay, 55 through 58. When Saul saw David was going out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this youth? Now, David had been around Saul, but he just didn't recognize him. All right? And Abner said, as your soul lives, O king, I don't know. So the king said, inquire whose son this young man is. Then, as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistines, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. This is my trophy. Cool. And Saul said, Whose son are you, young man? So the answer, uh, David answered, I am the son of your servant, Jesse the Bethlehemite. Saul, <coughs> who is my new son-in-law? Remember, gave his daughter. Gave his daughter. A tremendous victory. A supernatural victory. Okay. So, lest we just get caught up with a a bit of history. One of the Psalms that David wrote, just a one-liner in here. Psalm 40, verse 7, where it says, Then said I, lo, I come. In the volume of the book is written of me. Now, David would pin those words years later. The Bible is not about David. It's about Jesus. Lo, in the volume of the book, it is written of me. There is a tapestry. There is a picture that is painted, in a sense, in advance in prophecy. There is victory in our Lord. There is victory for his people. David would fight on ground that had been lost to the enemy. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost, indeed lost to the enemy. David saw the fear in Israel. He fought against it. Jesus sees the fear, listen to this, the intimidation, the enemy, indeed our own flesh. He says, fear not, over and over, fear not. David was sent by Jesse, his father, to the place of battle. Jesus was sent by our Father God to a fallen world to, indeed, the battleground. All right? David was harassed by his brothers, rejected, told to go back home. Jesus came to his own, but his own did not receive him. David and Jesus won the battle, but it was not without a fight that the enemy would give up easily. David and Jesus, the victory was done before the battle had begun. There is David. We got a glimpse. Certainly Jesus. 
We need to recognize, almost done now, that we are not in a playground. We are in a battleground. By the way, we do not fight, listen to this, for victory because that victory is already done in Christ. I was talking with the boys this morning about the logo, the seven with the cross, the questions there. Seven, the number of completeness in the word. Cross is there. We are complete in Christ. Tell us. Why? Because the victory is already done. He did the work. Indeed. This is all part of the adventure that he allows us to be a part of. David and Goliath. There it is. Let's close in prayer. Father God, thank you indeed for the day that you've given us. A day like no other day ever before. Thank you for the victory that we have in you. Thank you, Lord, that it is ever so complete. Lord, your life, your death, your resurrection, Lord, you are on the right hand of the Father, and you are coming again. Lord, this world, which is very broken, will not always be this way. You are going to make it, and make it wonderful, even as creation cries for the restitution of all things. Lord, we thank you, we praise you, but most of all, we thank you for Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.